So we begin chapter 10. Now, here is one positive thing about chapter 10. It is basically the last two chapters, or even you might even want to consider the last three chapters that we've covered kind of combined, and there's really not going to be uh, too much new material in this chapter. Uh, everything's basically going to look like it has doubled in size because uh, instead of doing one sample confidence intervals and uh, one sample hypothesis testing, we're now going to be doing two sample confidence intervals and two sample hypothesis tests. So our formulas are going to look like they've grown twice as big since we now have two samples. And at first it looks very menacing. I will admit it looks very menacing, but really it's not going to be that bad. Okay, so the first video we're just going to talk about sampling distributions, which this goes all the way back to three chapters ago in chapter seven uh, when we first started this semester, really. So we're going to be talking about sampling distributions for the difference of two proportions. So the first three videos of this chapter are going to be dealing with proportion problems, uh, and the last four videos will be dealing with uh, mean level problems. Now. This is stuff from chapter seven. This is old stuff. This should not look brand new to you. It shouldn't. Hopefully, uh, we talked about that if we had a sampling distribution, that if we took many, many, many random samples from a population and we collected sample proportions, p hats, of from all of those many samples, and if we were to uh, pull together all of those p hats, all of those p hats would make a beautiful shape. They would make an approximately normal distribution. Really, if, and here we have a condition that we have been using off and on the past two chapters, if this condition has been met, then we can say, yes, it is approximately normal. The mean of a sampling distribution, mu sub p hat, if we took our many, many, many p hats from all of our many, many, many random samples, and we found the mean mu of all of these p hats, the number that we would get would be the population proportion, which is what a which is the value that we would try to estimate uh, in confidence intervals. We would try to capture this particular value, and we would say that mu sub p hat was an unbiased estimator for p, that they were really the same thing. Uh, the standard deviation for our spread, basically, here. Uh, we have this formula, the square root of p times 1 minus p all over n. And again, that should look pretty similar from last chapter uh, because we used it as our standard error formula. And we can only use and calculate a standard deviation if our independent condition has been met. And that, again, is our population is at least 10 times the sample size. Now, all of this is old stuff. We're not directly going to be using this stuff in this chapter. We're going to be using elements of this stuff. This is going to be kind of a background for this chapter. Here's what it's going to look like, though, for this chapter. We're still going to be dealing with an approximately normal distribution. Except now, since we will be dealing with two samples, and before I jump into this, my note up here, everything related to the first sample will have a little one as a subscript. It doesn't always have to have a one, uh, but it usually specifies this is the first sample. And you'll see little two subscripts usually for anything that signifies any information from a second sample. So instead of just having n times p and n times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10, now it doubles in size. We have to do that for both samples. So the first sample size times the first proportion, is it greater than or equal to 10? Likewise with the n times 1 minus p, where the n and the p both are related to the first sample. And you also have to do it for your second sample. Okay, so everything's doubling in nature here. The mean, if we were to subtract two proportions from each other, uh, for example, if I said, uh, if we used our 62% CADA number, you know, we have 62% of CHS students do not drink. We could say, what if we pulled... Uh, a sample proportion from uh, O'Fallon High School. What if O'Fallon High School's numbers are 65%? And we could subtract those two proportions and say, well, there's a difference of 3%. And is that 3% a large enough difference 
that we could say our schools are similar to each other or they are different than each other in terms of uh, student alcohol consumption. Those are the types of ideas we're going to be looking at this chapter. So the mean of all p hats from two samples subtracted against each other is the same thing as really the population proportions being subtracted from each other. So notice how this looks very, very similar to this, except now it's doubled in size. We now have two proportions to discuss. Uh, again, uh, this mu sub p1 hat minus p2 hat is an unbiased estimator for our population mean here. Standard deviation. Before I jump into the formula, we still have to check, check the independent condition. But again, it is doubled in size. We have to check it for both of our samples. So again, look at this. This is for one sample. Now notice it's basically doubling in size underneath the square root. We now have two of those, one for each sample. So these are the things we're going to be using for this section. And then we're going to be using basically these things whenever we talk about confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So the one example we're going to look at together it says 46.6% of CHS students are considered low income by the state. 94.5% of ESHS students are considered low income by the state. A random sample of 200 CHS students and 200 ESHS students was taken. And the difference of P1 hat minus P2 hat from the samples yielded a result of negative 53.6%. Now we are referring to CHS basically as our first sample and uh, ESHS as our second sample. So it makes sense that if we were to subtract, you know, we would expect 46.6% CHS and 94.5% ESHS, that if we subtracted a smaller number and a larger number, that we would expect a, a negative value, which is what we got here. Now, could we have written it backwards and said P2 hat minus P1 hat? Sure, we could have. It can really go either way. It depends on if you're okay with dealing with a negative difference or if you're only concerned about positive differences. It can go either way. So number one, we're going to talk about shape, center, and spread of our sampling distribution of our P1 hat minus P2 hat. Okay, If we were to take many, many, many random samples of size 200 from each school and from each calculate a p hat and subtract those numbers and do that over and over and over again. And if we were to stack all of these differences of our sample proportions, we're going to hope for an approximately normal distribution. But first we have to check, oh my gosh, all four of these. So we need to check is n1 times p1 greater than or equal to 10 etc, 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 etc. So it's going to take a little while to write all these down real quick. So then we test each one. So for the first one, our, so again, keep in mind, our first sample is CHS students. So in, in really all four of these cases, will be 200 because we have the same sample size. And then P1 is our population proportion. This is for all CHS students, is 0.466. Now, I didn't tell you what the sample proportion was that we got from our 200 students because it's irrelevant. We don't really need to know that specific number. Now, these two numbers multiplied together is 93.2, which is check greater than or equal to 10. And then if I take 200 mi or times 1 minus 0.466, I get 106.8, which is greater than or equal to 10. Check. Now I've got to use my second sample values for ESHS. So again, my N is 200. My uh, proportion is the 0.945 from here. And that value is 189, which is greater than or equal to 10. And do my 1 minus P2. And I get 11. Very close, but it is greater than or equal to 10. So since all four of these check out, and this is an all or nothing thing here, since all of these check out, we may assume the shape of the sampling distribution of the differences of the proportions 
is approximately normal, which will allow us to later to use normal CDF in our calculations. Part two, the center. We want to know what is the mean of all possible combinations of P1 minus P2 hats for many, many random samples. And I mentioned earlier, that's just the difference of your population proportions. So those numbers are the 0.466 and the 0.945. So we would expect, okay, this specific number is what we would expect to happen. But it's not necessarily going to happen. There's always going to be some variation going on. So we would expect a difference of 47.9%. What we saw was 53.6%. So then we will discuss in a bit here, you know, are these two, or is this, uh, is our sample difference proportion here, is it far enough away from what we would expect to happen that we really question whether these numbers we were given are really true or not? Part three, the shape, or not the shape, the spread, I mean, which is related to our standard deviation. First, let's check our two conditions here, or really the one condition twice. Are the populations for both schools at least 10 times the sample size? Well, we're really talking about the population of CHS, which is right around 2,000 students. So, is 2,000 greater than or equal to 10 times 200? Yeah, it, this is really the exact minimum we would need to see here. It is equal, so this does check out. Now, the population of ESHS is 2,500 students, okay? Now, you would need to be, you would have to be given this information. Uh, basically, I'm telling this information to you now at this point. So, 2,500 is, in fact, greater than or equal to 2,000. So, these two conditions have checked out. Therefore, we may calculate the standard deviation. So, here is that big, crazy formula, which I've already plugged the numbers into. Now, again, the big crazy formula was our P1. Let me use a little bit. P1 times 1 minus P1 all over N1 plus P2 times 1 minus P2 all over N2. And I've plugged in all of those values here. And you can put this into your calculator all in one shot. And you should, and you might want to double check just to make sure you get this number, that is the standard deviation. We're almost at a 4% standard deviation here. So part B, calculate the probability of getting a difference in sample proportions of 55.6% or more. So we want to find out how rare is our 55.6% in the whole. So we want to find the probability that we get other difference of sample proportions, P1 hat minus P2 hat, that are more extreme or as extreme than what we saw. We're really going to be calculating a p-value, if you will, from last chapter. So we said we could use normal CDF, because we verified the shape is normal. Uh, here is our mean, right in the middle, which we calculated earlier. So this negative 0.479 that's what should go in the middle. Um, my 0.556 here, I just kind of estimated it's a little bit more than two standard deviations away. So I put it a little bit beyond two standard deviations below. And I want to shade in the extreme area here. Now if I look at my picture, my lower bound is negative infinity. My upper bound is my sample proportion difference here. Here's my mean, and here's my standard deviation. And I get an answer that is 0 0.02354. So what I saw happen only happens a little over 2% of the time. When I would expect or assume a negative 47.9% should happen. So part C. Does the result in part B give us reason to doubt the percentages reported by the state? Now, again, what we just calculated was a p-value. And if we put it up against an alpha value of 0.05, then we would reject basically the null hypothesis that those numbers are correct. 
uh, our alternate hypothesis would be basically that the numbers are not correct. So we would have reason to doubt the percentages reported by the state about the low income levels. You know, uh, is the 46.5% and the 94.5% are those really actual values? We would hope so that the state wouldn't lie to us about such things, but based on our uh, random samples of 200 each, it seems kind of doubtful that maybe those really are the actual percentages. You know, maybe our two uh, 200 samples, maybe we did something wrong. Okay, we, we really don't know. So we could have made a type 1 error in this case, because we were saying we're basically rejecting the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate, uh, so maybe we committed a type 1 error. We don't really know. So here's the one problem I want you to look at and try and bring to class the next day. We will go over it together. Again, it is very important that you guys practice and get better at doing these problems. And you might think, well, since Mr. G said all of these problems are basically from the last two chapters, and I did okay the last two chapters, that, <coughs> excuse me, I basically don't have to try very hard this chapter. That is definitely not the case. You're still going to have to put in probably the same amount of effort as you have been the past few chapters to still like, to do exceedingly well this chapter. So that is all for chapter one. And I am Batman.